In 1967, the Red Sox were in turmoil. Owner Tom Yawkey was threatening to move the team as the city didn't help him build a new ballpark to replace ancient 55-year-old Fenway Park. The 1966 Red Sox finished ninth in a 10-team league, their eighth consecutive losing season. Attendance had dropped to the lowest levels since World War II. A change was needed. In 1967, Joe Martin and Jack Carroll were youthful Fenway Park vendors. Well, there was nobody in the park. Three, four thousand, maybe. This was a bleak place. Uh, you, you could buy a ticket and walk into Fenway Park anytime you wanted. Bill Nowlin was a local kid who loved the Red Sox. In 65, uh, I came to just a game in September and saw Dave Moorhead pitch a no-hitter, but there were only 1,242 people in the stands. Toby Coffin was an 11-year-old Sox fan. We lived and died by it, but uh, we hadn't seen any success out of the Red Sox in our lifetimes, that's for sure. 13-year-old Dan Shaughnessy had been a Sox fan for five years. It was magic for me. I'd go there, I'd go down to the rail and peel some paint off and bring it back and have a piece of Fenway in my bedroom, and it was a big deal. Uh, I was really immersed. I knew a lot about them. I followed it. I would, I would get very upset when they would just year after year lose and take these beatings. The club had reached a low point in 1965, losing 100 games and drawing just 8,000 fans per game. It's not easy to lose 100 games. You've got to be really bad to do that. <laughs> we, we didn't disappoint. We were a terrible team. Team captain Carl Yastrzemski had won a batting title, two gold gloves, and was a three-time All-Star. But even Yaz couldn't make the Sox winners. It always seems that, uh, you know, you're out of everything by the All-Star break every year. The culture of losing overshadowed the fact that the Sox farm system was beginning to turn out winners. There was Reggie Smith, Rico Petroselli, George Scott, Joe Foy, Mike Andrews, Dalton Jones, Sparky Lyle, and Jim Lomborg. We all came up together within a year or so of each other. We knew each other, and it was like a family. I mean, it was, it was terrific. And there was a young, emerging local superstar. I'm from the North Shore, and when uh, Tony Canigliaro came up in 64, he was the equivalent of a rock star, you know, he, to, especially to the locals. As a 19-year-old rookie from nearby Revere, Massachusetts, Canigliaro had homered in his first at-bat in the big leagues, then went on to hit 23 more that year. In his sophomore season of 65, he hit 32 homers, becoming the youngest American League home run champ ever. In 66, he hammered 28 more. It was a dream for every all these little kids in the stands. That kid was just one of us. With talent, movie star good looks, his own record album, and a personality the fans and the cameras adored, Tony C was a New England phenomenon. It was just crazy, you know, with people chasing him around, stalking him, and one girl dropped off a bag of $500 at our front door to get a date with him. But the club continued to lose. A change was needed. And before the 1967 season, that change was made. The Red Sox farm system that was producing a slew of big leaguers also produced the club's next manager. I'll guarantee you we'll have a hustling ball club. I honestly think we'll win more ball games than we lose. Dick Williams, who played and learned in the Dodgers organization, had been managing much of the ball club's young talent for two seasons at the Red Sox AAA affiliate in Toronto. Having played on the Sox in 1963 and 64, Williams knew what he was getting into. It had some talent, it didn't have any discipline, it was a country club. He knew who the hard workers were and the guys that were just kind of slack, and, and he didn't want that to happen under his watch. Spring training was like boot camp. They thought I was nuts. Uh, 
got shook up a little when I was very demanding uh, with how they approach the game of baseball. Now we're going to hit and run, bunt guys over, get some good pitching, play, play good fundamental baseball. He taught us how to win. He taught us how to play hard. He taught us how to prepare to win. Even before Williams boot camp, Yaz had done an intense off-season fitness program with former Hungarian boxing champ Gene Berdy. He pounded me for two hours, four times a week, five times a week, and uh, it paid off. Although Yaz was team captain, Williams was commander-in-chief. I even took the captaincy away from him. I said, there's going to be one captain, that's me, and the rest of you are, I'm the chief and you're the Indians. Uh, and he was happy for that. He didn't want to be the captain. He didn't want the extra burden of everybody running to him uh, complaining about something. The season began in Boston with Lomborg beating the White Sox in front of just 8,324 fans. The next day, the Sox would draw just 3,600 fans. The club then went to New York for the Yankees' home opener. In his major league debut, Sox hurler Billy Rohr took a no-hitter into the ninth inning. One out later, Raw was one strike away from a no-hitter. Facing Yankees legendary catcher Elston Howard, Raw reached back for immortality. Three balls, two strikes, two outs. Base hit! Raw finished with a one-hitter. All of a sudden, something was different. You know, there just seemed to be a different... Uh, a uh, feel to everything, and it, it rolled from there. By June of 1967, Williams' focus on fundamentals was starting to turn into wins. The whole attitude uh, changed because everybody stopped thinking about winning. That summer, Lomborg would leave the team to fulfill his duties with the Army Reserve, but Tom Yockey's private plane saved most of his starts. The commander actually said, you know, I don't mind him pitching these games for you guys, but uh, he has to be back for Reveille the next morning. That was the only condition. General Manager Dick O'Connell was the architect of the team, and he made some key moves. In 66, O'Connell had traded for pitcher John Wyatt. In 67, Wyatt won 10 games and saved 20. Then in June of 67, O'Connell got pitcher Gary Bell from Cleveland. Bell won 12 games in those critical months for the Sox. And on June 1st, O'Connell acquired super sub Jerry Adair, who played either second, third, or short in 89 games. Due to injuries to certain players, he played more and more, and he did really well. Probably the best stretch of three months of his whole major league career. Ooh. Confidence was building. In a June contest, they stood up to the Yankees in a brawl and beat them 8-1. to one. And it's getting hot. There goes Pepitone as they go to it here at Yankee Stadium. Yaz, Tony C., Rico, and Lomborg were named All-Stars. Most important, though, unlike any recent season, the Sox were still in the pennant race, just six games behind the White Sox. It is 5 to nothing. Line drive toward Thomas. He's got it, and the Red Sox do it again. Soon after the All-Star break, on the road, the Sox completed a 10-game win streak with Lomborg earning three of those wins. They were just a half game out of first place in a pennant race for the first time in nearly two decades. And it is gone for a home run. Penigliaro puts the Red Sox on top two to nothing. I just didn't have any um, relevant experience of the Red Sox playing 500 baseball. It had never happened in my lifetime. Never mind pennant racing. When the Sox returned from their victorious trip, they were greeted at Logan Airport by thousands of fans. We went and got our bags on the, in the baggage claim area and people were patting us on the back. We all just kind of looked around and said, you know, something special is going on here. That's when it all started uh, with the fans coming back to the ballpark. 
In the ninth win of the streak, at just 22 years old, Tony C. became the youngest in American League history to reach 100 career homers. The next homestand featured crowds of 33, 34, and 35,000. However, if they were to stay in the pennant chase, one of the teams they'd have to beat was Chicago. Their manager, Eddie Stanky, tried to rattle the Sox, saying Yaz was an all-star from the neck down. Paul Yastrzemski, Paul Yastrzemski, Paul Yastrzemski, the man they call Yaz, we love him. But Yaz never wavered, hovering near the top of the league in batting average, homers, runs batted in, and work ethic. He wasn't happy with something. So he got the coaches together, went out after the ball games, took extra batting practice, worked on things. August began with the Sox trailing Chicago by two and a half games. Yes, Stremski makes the catch. O'Connell acquired a catcher who had played in nine World Series, the man who had broken up Billy Roar's no-hitter, the Yankees' Elston Howard. Also that August, a young New Yorker just in town to begin studies at Harvard became a Red Sox fan. It was impossible not to fall in love with them because they had such great uh, spirit. By August 18th, the Sox were just three and a half games behind the Twins in a five-team pennant race. That night, the Sox dream seemed to crumple to the dirt when Tony C. was hit in the face by a Jack Hamilton fastball. It was just silence. 35,000 people, everybody went silent. On deck hitter Rico Petroselli reached Tony C. first. I kept saying, Tony, Tony, you okay? You know, can you can you hear me? And he wasn't saying anything. We really thought that night that he wasn't going to make it because he was on the critical list. The next day, uh, it was just silent in the clubhouse. I think, uh, I know I was uh, thinking it's over, the run is over. Tony Conigliaro's beaning knocked him out of the lineup for the rest of the 1967 season. That could have taken the wind out of the Red Sox sails, but somehow it didn't. With less protection in the lineup, pitchers threw at Yaz, which was unacceptable to Jim Lomborg. I got hit uh, in Chicago uh, a couple weeks before uh, the season ended. We were playing a doubleheader there and Lomberg was pitching the second game and he comes up to me and he says, uh, who do you want me to get? Of course, I hated Gary Peters at that time because he always threw at me. Yeah. And it happened to be uh, Gary Peters pitching the second game. I said, I want you to get Peters, okay? <laughs> yeah. Chill enough, first pitch, bang. <laughs> On August 26th, the Sox had sole possession of first place for the first time all season. The next night, clinging to a 4-3 to three lead over the White Sox with one out in the ninth, right fielder Jose Tartabo threw to Elston Howard to get speedy Ken Berry at the plate for the unlikely double play to end the game and preserve the win. On August 28th, the Sox signed free agent, free spirit power hitter Ken Hawk Harrelson. We sort of instantly loved him because he got a clutch hit in the first ball game he came and played. On September 12th, Lomborg earned his 20th win. With just 14 games remaining, the Red Sox, Tigers, and Twins had identical records, and the White Sox were lurking. It's the greatest pennant race of all time. You know, four teams, one percentage point apart in August, September. Every game was critical because in those days there were no divisions. Playoffs did not yet exist. The first place team from each league went straight to the World Series. Is safe at home. George Scott, safe at home. As the pressure grew, so too did the legend of Yaz. The guy did it at the plate, he did it in the field, he made the throws, he was aggressive on the bases, he stole a few bases, I mean, he did everything. You almost had a sense that it was impossible to uh, get him out. It was still a four-team race with just four games to play. In the first of those four games, Yaz hit his 43rd homer of the season, tying Ted Williams' Red Sox single-season record for a left-handed hitter. But the Sox lost to Indians ace Louis Tiant. The next night, the Indians shut out the Sox. 
winning the pennant seemed to be an impossible dream. I thought our hopes were dashed. Uh, I got myself a six pack and went out and sat in my car so I could get the results of the uh, Chicago game against uh, Kansas City. And uh, they swept the doubleheader from the White Sox and put us back in the race. The White Sox lost again and were eliminated. So with two games left in the Sox season, it was a three-team race. Due to rainouts, the Tigers would play doubleheaders against the Angels both Saturday and Sunday. The Sox would go head-to-head -head with the first-place Twins, needing to win both. In that first game against the Twins, Yaz continued his superhuman performance, going three for four, including his 44th homer of the season, a team record for a left-handed hitter. With one game remaining, they had tied the Twins for first place. The Tigers and the Angels split, so on the final day of the season, it was still a three-team race. Williams tapped Lomborg to start what some say is the most important game in Red Sox history. On Sunday, October 1st, 1967, the Tigers won the first game of their doubleheader. It was a three-way tie for first with one game each to play. October 1st of 1967 saw three teams with identical records playing for the American League title. While the first place Tigers hosted the Angels, the first place Red Sox hosted the first place Twins. Minnesota took a two to nothing lead against Sox ace Jim Lomborg. That was the score when Lomborg led off the sixth. Manager Dick Williams chose not to pinch hit. Cesar Tovar was the third baseman at the time and uh, you know as you, you do when you come up to the plate you kind of scope out where everybody is and he was playing back behind the bag. Lomborg surprised everyone with a bunt single igniting a rally. Yaz tied the game with a two-run single. Lomborg scores. Adair will score. It's Yaz went four for four so he had gone seven for eight in the two most critical games of the season. With Lomborg still on the mound in the ninth, the Twins were down to their final out. Little soft pop-up, Petroselli will take it, he does, the ball game is over! The Red Sox win it! And what a mob on this field! They're coming out of the stands from all over! It was just uh, stopped in time to see all the players coming in onto the mound. And congratulating you and then turning around all of a sudden seeing strange faces and then there was more strange faces. Bill Nowlands was one of those faces. I believe I was in the first 20 or 30 or so because I got out there in time to, to get to Jim Lonboard. All of a sudden your teammates are gone and you're surrounded by strange happy faces headed towards right field, the pesky pole, and pretty soon I realized that I didn't want to go that direction. I really wanted to go to the dugout. Jack Carroll and Joe Martin were still working at Fenway, not as vendors, but by now they were police officers. It was up to them and patrolman Kenny Knave to rush Lomborg to safety. People in the dugout were yelling, go, go, go. We had to get out to the mound to get Lomborg. By the time we got to him, of course, his hat was gone and they were ripping his glove. One guy had the glove, we just grabbed the glove and put it back. And now you're moving in inches trying to get him to the dugout. Once we got him down there, whew. But I had never seen that many people in my life. In the clubhouse, the Sox listened to the Tigers-Angels game on the radio. And when Detroit's Dick McAuliffe hit into a game-ending double play, the Sox were American League champs. sudden for the TV uh, stations to switch back and go back to the Red Sox locker with them in celebration was just unbelievable. Seven for eight in the final two biggest games of your life. You're too much. <laughs> I was just trying the uh, best I could, Don, and uh, 
I had something going on for me. I wanted to win it for Mr. Yaki. Uh, he deserved it. That was without a doubt the, you know, my finest memory of being at Fenway Park. With 44 homers, 121 runs batted in, and a 326 batting average, Yaz had won the Triple Crown. When I saw Willie Mays play, I saw him break in. Uh, I played with Jackie Robinson, Duke Snyder, Campanella, Pee Wee Reese, all on one ball club. He had a year I've never watched a player have before or since. And I thought that explains it. He, he did it all. Toby Coffin added another hero to his list in 67, his father. And he said, uh, what are you doing tomorrow? I said, well, I'm going to school like I always do. He said, well, what if I told you I got a couple of tickets to game one? And I just, just melted. Getting into the ballpark and seeing people hanging from the billboards across the street. Uh, the excitement was something that I'd never seen before, you know, before that day, and I'm not sure that I've ever seen anything you know, beat it to this day. The Cardinals took game one at Fenway thanks to speedster Lou Brock, who went four for four, stole two bases, and scored two runs. A dominant Bob Gibson struck out 10 Red Sox. We had the team meeting and stuff, and um, everybody was saying, you got to be careful of this guy, and you got to be careful of Brock. You can't let him get on base. He's the igniter. And, I, and by the time the thing was over, does anyone have anything to say? And I said, well, how is Lou Brock going to be able to get on base if he's on his back. Game two began with a Lomborg pitch right under Lou Brock's chin. Lomborg was at his best. He had a no-hitter until there were two outs in the eighth. Gentleman Jim completed a one-hitter. Yaz, still red hot, hit two homers and drove in four as the Sox won five to nothing. In St. Louis, the Sox dropped the third game, and the incomparable Gibson threw a one-hit shutout in game four. The Cards were just one win away from the title. A determined Lomborg got the call in the must-win fifth game. Again, he shut out the Cards into the ninth. He had thrown 17 consecutive scoreless innings in the World Series. It's a zone where physically you have all of your skills and mentally you have all of your focus, and it all comes to play together. St. Louis put a run on the board in the ninth, but Lomborg got the three to one win. So it was back to Fenway for game six. The Sox played long ball, Rico hit two homers, Yaz and Reggie Smith also went deep, and the Sox won it eight to four, forcing a game seven. The impossible dream season again came down to just one game. With only two days rest, Lomborg got the call to pitch Game 7. He had pitched a couple times during the year because of his military commitment with uh, uh, two days rest. He had no decision in one and won another one, so I didn't think I was going uh, that far out on a limb. Bob Gibson's epic performance continued as he tossed a three-hitter and homered to end the impossible dream season. But there was no doubt the season was a success. It changed everything around. The stands were full again. And the most important thing was that we became winners instead of losers. The Sox attendance of 1.7 million led the American League and more than doubled their 66 total. They really went from black and white to color, as we like to say. Uh, it's the culture of, of losing an empty stadium and apathy just switched over and really since 67 they've been relevant every year. They were fun times. They were just, they were marvelous times. Red Sox Nation was born, Fenway was saved from the wrecking ball, and the rest is history.